Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, my name is Ramaya Krishnan. I am the dean of the Heinz College of Information Systems and, and Public Policy. And it's my pleasure to provide a brief introduction to this uh, really important panel on the $3.68 trillion question. I think it's, we're going to see what's that all about. Um, so the, the Heinz College is uh, home to Carnegie Mellon's Information Systems School and the Public Policy School, and is a center of excellence at the intersection of technology and society on issues particularly at the intersection of people, public policy, and technology. And healthcare is a really important and major part of what it is we do uh, at the Heinz College. Um, we are very pleased to have a number of National Academy members. Marty Gaynor, who you'll meet shortly, is a member of the National Academy of Medicine. Um, John Calkins was a member of the National Academy of Engineering, also worked. So there are a number of National Academy members who work on uh, healthcare, a number of award winners. The Aero Award, which is a very prestigious health economics award, has been won a number of times by faculty at Heinz. Um, and so the research and education, which I want to tell you a little bit about, um, has a number of uh, uh, very interesting uh, activities going on that bring together uh, and draw on CMU strengths in economics, statistics, uh, operations research, and information technology. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, the, the work that, that's, that's ongoing. Um, so Jeremy Weiss um, uh, is a, a MD-PhD on our faculty, and his lab um, works and develops predictive analytic uh, models using electronic health records um, to isolate homogenous risk groups for a variety of disease categories, diabetes, uh, opioid use, et cetera, to forecast risk. And um, that work has had a significant impact and influence. Professor Emma Padman and her lab have been working on um, digital vaccines. So this is the idea of using uh, games, for instance, to teach good eating habits to kids. This is very related to our, our keynote speaker, Steve Downs, this morning. Um, the idea of having these vaccines as interventions that actually allow for behavioral modification through games is an example of the work that she and her students have been engaged in using a, a game called FUYA. Um, Professor Emilia Haviland, who soon um, you'll see on the panel, has done foundational work on understanding uh, behavior of individuals when they're enrolled in low deductible and high deductible insurance policies and the manner in which they actually use and utilize healthcare when they're enrolled in these different policies. And Professor Marty Gaynor and his colleagues have done sort of path-breaking work on healthcare spending by people uh, who are enrolled in, in private health insurance. Um, so for instance, with a very unique uh, data set from three of the five largest uh, insurance companies in the US, with three billion uh, health insurance claims for 89 million people with uh, private um, employer-sponsored health insurance, Marty and his uh, colleagues have found that there are really large price differences for the same service, even in the same geographical area. And they've shown that the single most important factor driving hospital prices is a number of potential competitors nearby. So that's a, that's a good segue to the kinds of things that we're going to be hearing about in this panel today. But I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say a word about uh, the educational programs that actually build on this research. Uh, you heard from Kristen Curland in the previous panel about uh, the Masters of Medical Management program, which is a, a program for um, physicians, for uh, wanting to be physician executives. Uh, but in addition to that, we have uh, uh, both a healthcare policy and management program and a healthcare analytics program that really cross-train students in technology, analytics, and public policy and gets them to really work and engage on really important problems uh, not only in the community, because Pittsburgh is a healthcare leader, but more broadly uh, in the region as well. So a really uh, great complement to what you heard from my colleagues earlier today from the Tepper School, from engineering, and from computer science. So with, with that as a background, 
Um, I, I will now want to uh, say a few words about um, this uh, panel that um, my colleague Marty Gaynor is going to be moderating. Um, one of the things about Intersect that really excites me is about the fact that it really draws on the best, and best of everything at Carnegie Mellon. And um, our expertise in economics and operations and statistics, as well as in IT, and this panel that you'll uh, shortly be, um, be introduced to, the folks on the panel, they're going to take a deep dive into what is this $3.68 trillion question, which is about how do we address uncontrolled industry cost with policy, product, and process innovation. So if I could now request all the uh, participants to uh, come up on the stage. Um, they will be moderated by my colleague, Marty Gaynor, who's the E.J. Barone University Professor of Economics and Public Policy at, at CMU. Marty, take it away. Thanks very much, uh, Krishnan. Uh, that, that's a very nice uh, set, of, set of opening remarks. We're, we're really fortunate today to, to have a, a great set of panelists for you, and uh, immediately to, to my left, to your right, in order, are Amelia Haviland, who's Associate Professor of Statistics and Health Policy at the Heinz College at CMU. She's also the Director of the AI and Analytics for Good Initiative, the Block Center for Technology and Society. Then we have uh, Rumi Naik, who's uh, Vice President for Research and Development, and scientific and digital innovation at Sanofi Pasteur, and uh, Tom Pelothy, who's the executive VP, product and healthcare services, Highmark, and uh, Sridhar Tyre, Ford Distinguished Research Chair and University Professor of Operations Management at the Tepper School of Business. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists. <laughs> and we, we have... Uh, is this on? We have a lovely setting here. It kind of feels like, uh, like we're in a, a living room, except, uh, except in my house I wouldn't be allowed to sit on the furniture. So, uh, so this is a rare treat for, for me, <laughs> and for good reason. So <laughs> uh, uh, Kate and, and Bob Damon may regret the fact they let me sit on the living room furniture. Anyhow. Uh, we have a great panel here, and the way we talked about this before, we'd like to structure this for you, is we have a few questions or topics we're going to discuss uh, among ourselves, and then towards the end, of course, we'll have the opportunity for folks to, to ask brief questions. So let me start out, and I'm going to be a little provocative, deliberately, with, uh, with you folks. So we spend approximately $3.5 trillion on health care in the U.S., and that's nearly one-fifth of our national income. It's the largest sector of the US economy. So what? We're a rich country. We have to spend our money on something. This is the United States. We don't save, by the way. So we have to spend the money on something. Why not health care instead of sofas or refrigerators? Or are we spending too much and, and why? And I'll, I'll start uh, with Amelia, and then we'll just, just go down and ask, ask your, your opinions on this. So I think I'm on, is that right? Excellent. So I'm gonna start out by a rare instance of a woman splaining, I guess it would be, which is telling you about your research, Marty. Um, <laughs> and uh, which is very briefly, the Healthcare Cost Institute um, has shared with us that much of the increase in the amount that we spend on healthcare costs, and it has increased quite a bit over the last decade, for instance, um, is an increase in prices, not quantity. Um, so while a number of, th there are lots of opinions about whether there's overuse of care, most of that overuse is, has been shown to be a fairly small quantity in terms of the overall amount that we spend on care. So I think it can make sense if we want to look at this question of how much we're spending and are we happy with it, to think a lot about prices and how they come about. So that's one piece. The other piece, quickly, is that we are a wealthy country on average. I'm a statistician. So of course, on average, is not necessarily telling us much of anything about people's experience. So we're a wealthy country that has huge income disparity that's growing, partly um, uh, related to technology. Um, and there's uh, increasing evidence that there are a growing number of people who have problems paying for their healthcare. 
Um, so uh, not everyone can afford their refrigerators either. Um, and about five years ago, we found that about 60% of US households couldn't come up with $3,000 if they needed to, which is now not an uncommon deductible level for a health insurance plan. Now it's a bit worse. We now have about 60% of US households who can't come up with $500 if they need to. So we're a rich country on average. Okay. Thanks, Amelia. Yep. Oh, thanks. So, I, you know, it's very interesting all throughout today and even just now, we tend to mix uh, the individual experience with the social experience, okay, or the societal experience, the macro with the micro. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in an audience with a bunch of economists, so I need to be very <laughs> careful not to embarrass my alma mater, <laughs> okay. Um, but, but, it, but it is very, it is very curious. We are a rich country and we do need to spend money on something. Okay, and there's a lot of really great things that we should spend money on, like Carnegie Mellon, right? Um, right? Okay, good. Uh, Rob's but slip <laughs> <later>. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's good. I, I'm always happy to take money. <laughs> but you know, there's another aspect to it, though, which is that, and, and you're right. On average, we're a wealthy country. Okay, and so the question is, um, what should healthcare be like for disadvantaged? Um, and what are the untracked expenses and benefits we have in our society? Uh, that aren't accounted for by dollars and cents. So earlier there was a discussion of the placebo effect, and it's I, I want to take all of you with me, or maybe I need to move back to Pittsburgh, uh, because I think this is a really rich area of medical development. And, and it's not at all science fiction. It's very real. Uh, the placebo effect has nothing to do uh, with some mystery of a doctor walking in wearing a white jacket and telling you you'll be okay. Um, it's really everything to do with the fact that you really do regulate your body uh, through your cognition. Uh, and in ways we poorly understand, um, when you are poor, you tend to make bad decisions by structural means, right? So, and I, and I can you know, tell you many examples of this, like the three in the morning gas station burrito you have when you're leaving the lab at three in the morning, you're tired and you, you know, you're a graduate student, you're not very wealthy. Um, but a burrito feels really good, okay? Actually, it's terrible. It's a terrible idea, okay? I don't encourage anybody to do it. But that's why these things exist. And so uh, these are untracked costs in our healthcare system. And it would be very interesting, I think, for us to have a better grasp of where these uh, benefits and penalties come from in our society and how they contribute to the totality. Thank you. Tom. Yeah, first of all, thank you. I'm uh, really honored to be here, so thanks to CMU and, and Marty, thank you uh, for, for being here. Um, you know, I would reframe the question. Um, so I'm not sure the question is, is 3.68 trillion the right number or not? I think the right question is, is the healthcare system sustainable? And who is it sustainable for? And I, I think that sort of picks up on uh, points that Emilio was making. So. When we look at the sustainability of our healthcare system and the constituent parts, uh, you know, is the cost of healthcare sustainable for households? Are the costs of healthcare sustainable for businesses? Is the cost of healthcare sustainable from a fiscal perspective uh, for our government sponsored programs? And then when you look at the uh, economics of the industry itself, how do we think about the sustainability of the various pieces of the healthcare ecosystem? Um, so, you know, a fact I'd throw out is, you know, almost every rural hospital in uh, Pennsylvania is uh, struggling in terms of profitability. Um, and in fact, most are underwater. Um, what does that mean for us in terms of sort of the system and the access to care that's needed uh, for, in this case, rural geographies. So again, I, I'm not sure that the question, especially for a, a country uh, with the size and scope of economy as the US is, is 3.68 trillion the right amount. I think the question is, once we de-average and look at what's really going on, how is the healthcare system from a sustainability perspective working? Is it working for the outcomes that we're trying to get? And I think that when you look at health outcomes um, and when you look at sustainability, um, you, you, know, you run into some problems that have to be tackled. And so how, how are we transforming healthcare to uh, deliver better outcomes in a way that is uh, sustainable, I think is the hard question. Thanks, Tom. Sridhar, please. Thank you for putting me on the panel. Uh, I'm actually an outsider to healthcare. Uh, 
I'm a supply chain math computer science guy, so some of you may wonder why am I here. Um, the last few years I got into healthcare, so I want to answer this question by uh, maybe looking at a positive spin and a negative spin. What uh, fascinated me when I entered uh, healthcare, just uh, after starting my software company, I got into organ transplantation. The fact that uh, we can do a liver transplant, the fact that somebody was going to die within 90 days with probability, you know, 95%, and now they can live 32 extra years, you think it, it must cost money. It costs resources. It costs innovation. I mean, I think we, uh, to me, medicine, uh, we are so cynical about it, is actually a marvel of science and human ingenuity. Uh, somebody brought up uh, the documentary I uh, think made of uh, Starzl uh, that was played here, A Burden of Genius, and I've seen it two or three times. I know the director and, and, and the producer. To me, uh, that story, if you haven't seen it, you can see how much struggle uh, the number of people had uh, to take for a sustained number of years so that today uh, the problem is not the ability to do a liver transplant but the ability to have livers. That is, we have gone from uh, keeping people alive uh, for 30 years to saying, could we get more livers? So uh, part of my work has been uh, philanthropic in the sense of uh, creating nudge videos to get more organs to be donated. Because to me, uh, the marvel of uh, organ transplantation uh, is, is just too much. That, uh, and one of the people that I work with closely, uh, she was one year old uh, in 1983 or 84, uh, living in rural Ohio. And they said that she was going to die because, you know, she had a congenital liver. Uh, Starzl, and at that time a young fellow called Carlos uh, Esquizel, I think, was his uh, uh, young intern. Uh, Carlos now uh, runs Stanford uh, Pediatrics. Uh, they did the transplant. She turned 34 earlier this year, and she's a lawyer in, in Washington, D.C. To me, this is a miracle. Okay? So when we talk about uh, the money we are spending, the positive thing is we are actually doing things in this century and in the last 20 years that would be inconceivable. Uh, you know, 50 years ago. Okay, that's on the positive spin. Okay? Now for the real world. Okay? <laughs> Over testing, upcoding, uh, uh, you know, Medicare fraud claims, uh, doing 32 surgeries on a person who doesn't need uh, anything, uh, selling painkillers and opioids down, uh, down uh, people's throat. Uh, so there is the negative side uh, of, of the whole thing. So I think when, when I look at uh, 3.68 trillion, uh, and I also look at it from the perspective of what are all the positive things that 3.68 trillion is doing for our civilization, and then how much of this 3.68 trillion uh, is something that we say, oh, come on, uh, we should not do. So I, so I think that is one uh, 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 split I want to have. The other split is, uh, uh, again, uh, we are sitting here at Carnegie Mellon University. What drives us, uh, let's say, is to the next new thing. Right? In the sense that uh, my project is quantum-inspired algorithms for cancer genomics. It's a futuristic, sexy thing. Right? Is it the most useful thing today? No. Isn't it better for me to go help some hospital improve its operations? But it's not sexy. It's remedial work. So it, it's the same thing. When you look at how U.S. places in math scores around the country, around other countries, you'll say, oh, U.S. is so bad in math compared to Singapore uh, and so on and so forth. But three of the last four years, the math Olympiad has been won by U.S. Why? Because at the very top, we are very good, and at the very bottom, we are very bad. So I go back to the same thing again. You know, how is 3.68 delivering uh, the thing? Well, it's delivering great things to some people, but it's not delivering for others. So right. I, Thank you, thank you, that, and these, these are great. So actually, uh, we've heard a few, few things here that um, there are good reasons to think that we're getting lots of value from healthcare, and a lot more value now than we're getting uh, certainly 20 or 30 years ago, but even five years ago. However, there are also reasons to think that we're spending too much money, prices are too high, we're just paying more to existing producers of healthcare for the same thing, and in some cases maybe even something that's worse, or we're paying for things that aren't very effective, aren't worth what they cost, or maybe have no proven value whatsoever, and moreover, how the money gets spent 
is problematic. There is also the very important point that Tom raised about sustainability. There's a, a quote from a former federal official that the United States government is turning into a health insurance company with an army. And there's some truth to that because if you look at the federal budget, Medicare and Medicaid are going like this, and even Social Security is relatively flat compared to anything else. If you look at the income of U.S. households and what they spend on things after health care, the amount of money they have left to spend on housing, to spend on food, clothing, has been flat for the past 30 years. And of course, for the least fortunate among us, it's even a more desperate situation. So we have some problems. Let's, I wanna ask you folks some thoughts about, about some possible solutions. One is just kind of big picture. Do you think there's uh, sort of something that is a large overreaching, overreaching, that's not the right term, sorry. I betrayed myself. Um, a large overarching change or reform that we could make that would make a big difference? Or do you think we're better off pursuing incremental changes? I guess I'd call these 1% solutions. And 1% of 3.5 trillion, by the way, it's 3.5, not 3.68 if you look at US government statistics. Anyhow, uh, you know, but what's a few, you know, 180 billion or so between friends. So let me, let me start again with, uh, with Amelia and, and just go around. What are your thoughts on one thing or, or a few things, again, you know, be relatively concise, that we might do to address what you see as some of the major problems? Yeah, like many of us, I watched the debate last night, um, and so I'll reference some comments relative to that, to some of the policies that are being batted around now um, uh, quite actively. Um, you know, a lot of my research has been about how patients respond when we put things in their hands, when we say, you know, there's been um, discomfort with letting, uh, and legal um, uh, options when we've had health insurance companies make decisions about whether this care is high enough value for us to pay for it or not for you to get it. Um, there's been all kinds of panic about government death panels if they're the ones who are deciding whether we get care or not. And so a default has been the market has, has moved towards putting the decision into patients' hands. So instead, we're going to make do a cost shift, have more of the money come out of your pocket, and a lot of my work has shown what happens then. What are the kinds of choices that, that patients make? Are they then making perfect consumer-wise decisions of, about what kind of health care to get or not? And, you know, A, there's this huge problem that most people are financially constrained, right? So it's not like they have all of this disposable income and they're just deciding how much of it to spend on this. And so that's a huge piece of the story, right, is that a growing number of people are saying that they're, um, you know, not filling their prescriptions. We th see this in our own work. They're not filling their prescriptions. They're um, of foregoing needed care, right? And we see a lot of that, that patients cut care across the board when they are facing higher costs. They're not discerning which care is the high value and which is not. And it's hard. Right now, we can't get doctors to agree on which is the highest value or not either. So it's a pretty high ask for patients. So I think that's pretty problematic. Um, there are some other things that, that health insurance and providers are doing. Um, there's been some, some pretty um, good results of reference pricing. It's a thing where a, an insurance company says, we will cover this much for a hip replacement. Anything more than that, you pay out of pocket. My dad did something like this when I was shopping as a teenager. Well, I'll pay this much, but no more, right? And so reference pricing is exactly that. So California, uh, CalPERS, they're all their public employees. Um, they have a plan like this. And it worked because they have so much market power that a bunch of the providers said, OK, we'll charge that much. Right? So they moved their price to fit under there. But you need particular conditions for that to work. So I think single payer is pretty interesting. Take a big move. How much value are we getting from these private health insurance companies? What is the quality that they are adding, I think, is a very worthwhile question to ask. I don't have the answer, but I think it's a very worthwhile question to ask. The overhead for Medicare, right, our, our government, our health insurance company with an army, Medicare, has been lower than the private health insurance company every single year that Medicare Advantage has existed. They get paid more. The Medicare Advantage continues to get paid more. So what are we getting? I think it's worth asking. 
Thanks, Rumi. Please. So I, I want to be uh, both provocative and educational. If you'll if you'll just bear with me for a second here, um, you are what you measure. What is easy and sexy as heck to measure are the extreme cases, like I need a hip replacement, I have cancer. These are sexy medical outcomes. What is less sexy is just being healthy, okay? So, uh, Bad Religion, which is this great punk band, has this song, Infected, all right? And since I work in infectious disease, I'm a cell biologist by training, but I work in infectious diseases now. Um, the song starts something like this, you and me have a disease, you infect me, you affect me, okay? So that'll be my little bit of poetry. So the reason why I'm mentioning this here is, okay? <laughs> the reason why I'm mentioning this here is, so, so, so look, all of us have had the flu, okay? And it's a, it's a topic I care particularly about because I work on the flu vaccine. Um, I'm curious how many people in this audience got the flu vaccine and realize how much economic benefit you created for people sitting next to you. Okay, so could I just, if, I, if you don't mind me doing this for a second, can, can you stand if you got the flu vaccine last season? Just do me a favor. Okay, well, this is a great audience here, okay? This is a completely disproportionate. So you are, th see, so, so CMU pays for it, so this is a good point. Now, there's another part to this though, right? Is that, so, <laughs> so, so, but do you realize how much, <laughs> But, but do you realize how much good you did in society by doing this? You didn't do it for yourself. You did it for everybody else around you. We don't have easy ways, of, to your point, of what we can and cannot measure. We don't have easy ways of measuring the burden alleviated, not just for flu, but there's a whole panoply of other outcomes related to the flu vaccine that you may not be aware of, like reduction of heart disease. Okay. There is a ton of things, and so all this tells me, Marty, and this is, this is maybe my conclusion here, my thesis, um, healthcare lacks brand and product discipline. Okay, Red Bull can go out there and say, Red Bull gives you wings. And all of you get it, right? Because you think, oh yeah, we can go in a crazy airplane, we can jump off something, we can skydive, we can, we can leap from the sky. Somehow, when you talk about Red Bull and say, Red Bull gives you wings, you understand what's being communicated. When we talk about health, there is a brand and product discipline gap that doesn't exist in any other field. Because when we are trying to tell you this is the value of being healthy, you don't know what that means, even though you go through your day trying to be healthy and not get hit on the sidewalk. Okay, so the real gap, the real fiscal gap at play is not what happens in the sexy cases, but in the unsexy cases too. Thanks. Tom, please. Yeah, you know, when I think about this, I, I kind of start um, with what are really the drivers of uh, kind of cost inflation within the system, right? And uh, when you start to unpack that, um, there are some things that jump out, um, and I don't know if I have um, good solutions for them, but, you know, uh, we absolutely, uh, to pick up on the previous point, uh, have a system that is uh, really a system for sick care, not for health. Um, and so we treat sickness. But when you think about the changing nature of the burden of disease within the country, as we continue to have a population that is living longer, as we see uh, sort of the uh, number of folks who have uh, kind of chronic conditions and multiple chronic conditions increasing, uh, we see kind of the um, demand for health and health care uh, changing. And uh, we don't really have a system that is set up to engage folks in their health, keeping them healthy before they become uh, sick in the first place, and then for managing the chronic conditions that emerge uh, as a result of that. So uh, a big uh, kind of a suggested solution around that, which the industry talks a lot about, which is really, really important, is kind of shifting uh, the payment model, the economic logic within healthcare, to go from sort of fee-for-service where uh, the clinical community, the provider community is paid uh, on the number of services that they provide, to instead trying to incent the clinical community on the outcomes they achieve. So that when you're a primary care doc, it's worth your effort 
to spend 45 minutes with a patient instead of 15 minutes with a patient to make sure that they're healthy and prevent all of those downstream costs that are going to come if that patient isn't healthy. So that's, that's kind of one thing. Um, another thing I'd sort of point to is uh, the nature of medical technology is uh, advancing extraordinarily rapidly. And uh, we can do things now outside of the hospital setting that, uh, you know, a few years ago would be unimaginable, right? You can get an outpatient, same-day bone marrow transplant. Um, uh, so, uh, but we have a legacy healthcare system that was really designed at a time when the major driver of uh, care was accidents and things like that, where you kind of had to show up in a big box hospital and, and get that care. But of course, uh, those uh, institutions have really, really high costs, high fixed costs. It costs a lot of money to run a hospital. And so you got to keep seeing patients uh, in those settings of care. So another question would be, how do we leapfrog kind of the care delivery model that we have today, which is really sort of built post-World War II, uh, to a much more modern infrastructure which embraces telemedicine, which embraces smaller format type uh, 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 kind of clinical models uh, which have a lot less fixed costs and therefore less expensive to run uh, so that healthcare becomes a bit more affordable. That'd be kind of a second thing I'd point to. Uh, a third thing I'd point to is pharmacy and specifically specialty pharmacy. And when you look at the rate of price increase within uh, healthcare, the rate of price increase of specialty pharmacy in particular um, is incredibly high. Now, those therapies are amazing. I mean, the, 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 they're curative in many instances, they're personalized, uh, they're amazing. They're also incredibly expensive, millions of dollars per treatment. And I think that uh, there isn't a good answer, quite honestly, societally, uh, we haven't had a good discussion as a society on how those therapies are going to be uh, paid for and uh, uh, kind of uh, provided. So, specialty pharmacy is just a just a huge driver. I mean, uh, the rate of increase of specialty pharmacy over the last few years, kind of, uh, if it continues, will swamp the entire uh, kind of. Um, uh, just to hit on the private insurance, the entire margins of the entire health uh, insurance industry in the country, right? So, uh, I mean, it's a really big number. Uh, so how do we deal with that? And then I'd, I'd point to maybe a fourth thing, which is we're learning increasingly, and in my last thing, uh, fourth thing is um, we're learning that um, a lot of the drivers of health aren't health in the traditional sense of the word. Um, so we're learning that, um, to use industry jargon, sort of the social determinants of healthcare, uh, you know, your neighborhood, uh, your education level, your income level, um, the access to services that you have in your community are major drivers of healthcare outcomes. Um, and in many instances, in many communities and with many segments of the population, th those uh, services are failing folks. Um, and when you look at the breakdown of healthcare costs, it tends to be that a very small percentage of the population is driving a very large percentage of the cost. And so uh, health, if we're really interested in driving health, has to extend beyond sort of the traditional definition of health to how do we engage a broader ecosystem to try to uh, solve some of these problems. Um, and, um, you know, I would. Uh, sort of point to um, some of the behavioral health challenges that the country is facing. Again, behavioral health in conjunction with chronic conditions is exponentially driving costs, not linearly driving costs. Um, we, have, we have a real crisis in our country around that. So there are big issues like that that uh, I think if we were serious about tackling would really change the sustainability equation um, that's, that's leading to, I think, some of the uh, ongoing debate around why is healthcare broken in the country. Thanks, Tom. Sridhar, please. So I think, uh, I think uh, I'm not a, uh, I'm too old to be a revolutionary. I mean, I know Bernie's older and he's a revolutionary, but I think uh, I look for uh, implementable uh, 
local solutions that hopefully will, will improve. I know it won't be the global greenfield optimal solutions that uh, maybe the generation of AOC and others would like. Uh, but uh, I, I look for uh, uh, improvements that can be made that I think will reduce cost, improve outcomes, improve access, and, and do things. So to, I think one of your questions was, is it about making small changes? And I think, uh, again, I'm an outsider. I've been doing this only for about seven or eight years. Uh, I can see a, a bunch, of, uh, bunch of small improvements. I also uh, want to echo uh, the point that you made about rural hospitals. Uh, I'm on the board of Heritage Valley Health System, which is our community hospital, you know, Beaver, uh, and so on. And this is the, the discussion we have in the board meetings. Uh, the payment schemes are going to observational from, uh, right, uh, hospital visits. Um, uh, that's one-fourth the reimbursement. But then we have this whole uh, infrastructure of the hospitals, right? And so we have to change uh, the structure of delivery. Uh, it's going to take time uh, to, to do it, and so I think uh, it is happening, but it's being driven, uh, I suppose, by the, by, by the payment uh, scheme. The one big change, I think, uh, that would be needed uh, is going to be long-term, and using the phrase, you are what you eat. Uh, in some sense, you know, we can do quantum computing, we can do bone marrow transplants, and we can do all of these things, but uh, if you're not eating healthy, or if you're, if you're not doing the exercises and so on and so forth, uh, in some sense, uh, we can improve by 3%, but if you're getting worse by 4%, then, uh, you know, we get back into the... Uh, so I think there is a cultural shift that's needed, which is, might be considered almost un-American, uh, uh, to, to, to view uh, that uh, creating profits for the pharmaceutical company is not your primary purpose in life, uh, that uh, perhaps uh, when you get tired, you don't need to take a chemical, that uh, drinking some extra water and getting rest would do. I know I might get thrown out of this country for uh, <laughs> providing some anti-capitalist messages here, but uh, uh, I'm a software entrepreneur, just, to, just for, uh, to, so you're not confused. <laughs> Uh, 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 but, I, but I believe that uh, a certain amount of restraint and self-discipline and cultural upbringing is needed where uh, you don't have to pop a pill every time you think you might get sick. And I, and I, and I think uh, that, that's kind of the big thing, I think, that would be needed. Yeah. Well, thanks. These, these are all great thoughts. And I, I think uh, uh, people have said, uh, you know, there's, there's some themes emerging here. And one of the things I think that is very important is that uh, things we do as individuals, uh, whether we think of them as health habits or not, just our lifestyle choices, have really profound impacts on our, our health and ultimately actually on the healthcare system and on healthcare costs. However, I'll interject, changing the healthcare system is child's play compared to trying to get people to change the way they eat. Uh, so I, I think that's, that is a major challenge, but I certainly do agree. We know that, uh, that we have a real problem with obesity in this country, right? We're number one. We're the, we're the fattest country in the world, and nobody, and you know, France and Germany are catching up, but I, I think we'll manage to stay ahead. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a real problem for those of us who struggle with their weight, but also it's a problem for the whole country. We know that leads to a much enhanced chance of diabetes, it puts strains on the heart, people end up uh, if they have reasonable access to health care, not, not all of us do, uh, spending a lot more on health care. It affects their education, it affects their acquisition of skills and their life prospects. It's a profound social problem, but it's also something very hard to change. I don't think it's reasonable or realistic to expect health care providers to somehow wave a magic wand and change that. Let's come back to healthcare. One thing I think I'm hearing from everybody is the system is, is underperforming, that uh, either the right kind of services are not provided, some services are overprovided, some people are not getting services they provide, uh, the system does not serve patients well. Right? Anybody think of healthcare as epitom epitomizing great customer service? Great customer relations. Stand up, by the way, if you think that. It's one of the best industries in the entire country at serving its customers. No, we all know that it's, that it's terrible. So 
what do we do about it? It's a tough problem. In some ways, we have a perfect storm of problems, right? The healthcare dollar at once is everybody's and nobody's. As somebody who has health insurance, everything I do generates spending, and sometimes it's well worth it, but I pay a, a small share of that. Well, we might like to try and get that reduced. I don't have the incentives to try and do that. Moreover, the providers, the doctors, the imaging centers, the pharmaceutical companies all benefit. All of that cost is their income. So trying to reduce that is very difficult. It's also the case that there's very little that's pure waste that literally benefits no one. So we have a, we have a tough problem, but we, we have this system that uh, at least we're hearing is not really very dynamic, not very innovative, very, very sluggish. So we still have the models from the 50s or 60s where everything gets directed back to the mothership, the inpatient institution. How do we change that? Well, if it's hard for new and innovative entrants to get a toehold, get into the market, and compete on the merits with existing firms, then how do we change that? You folks have some thoughts about how we go about doing that, whether there are some private efforts that we can undertake and government efforts. Are there things that the public sector can do either on its own or things that enable the private sector to be more effective than what we're currently witnessing? And I'll, at this point, I'll just open it up and let, let anybody respond who wants to. I just want to make sure everybody has a chance to respond who, who does. So yeah, so let's let's just let's play a little game for a second here. Okay, so um, one of the challenges that any healthcare provider has is they have an uncertain demand. Okay, I don't know who's going to walk in the door with what problem. Okay, um, so imagine, and this goes, and you're going to have to help me, Shudar, because you're actually a supply chain expert. Okay, so imagine we treat this as a supply chain problem, and we say I want to somehow level my demand. Right, that would make things a lot easier for me if I knew that every day. I'm going to do blood work. I'm going to do 20 blood draws. I'm going to apply 20 bandages. Okay, and so that would be that's how you solve problems, supply chain problems elsewhere, right? You try to level the demand. Okay, and and this is the genius of of lean and what Henry Ford did, right? Is to try and make flow lines and so on. Okay, why can't we do that for healthcare? That's so that's an open question I'd, I'd like to discuss, right? And part of that is that right now we don't seem to have a utility. Uh, as much as we would like to, and I'm now talking as a scientist, for healthy people to come into the hospital. Okay, so when was the last time you went to, the, to your doctor, you went to the hospital and said, I am perfectly healthy, what I would really like from you right now is you to take a little blood from me for the hell of it. Okay, <laughs> for science. Okay, now, I'm telling you though, that's actually the data, those data are exactly data I would love to have. Right, because those are the data I'm missing. I don't know what is a healthy person? Just like we don't know what is, neuro what is, what is neurotypical. That these, are, these are words that we use, we don't know what they mean. And a lot of this is from having an unmet demand cycle at the primary, at the primary providers. Now, so again, suppose you knew that every day I was gonna hand out 20 bandages. Most of this billing stuff goes away. You just buy 20 bandages, right? You don't need people to process paperwork. You just buy a set of 20 bandages for that day and you're done. So with that in mind, I, I'd really love to hear what you all have to say about this, to think creatively about something silly. Sure, you're the supply chain person. Would you like to respond? And then, of course, uh, Amelia and Tom. I'm just so happy I got to give a professor homework on stage. <laughs> that was, yeah. uh, that by, was a good, that by was a the good way, answer by asking By the question. way, there's a quiz at the end, so I hope all of you are prepared. Yeah, so I think, again, I, I go back to what is also in, in, in real world uh, private businesses, that 80% of the demand is probably stable and 20% of the demand uh, moves around. I mean, uh, and so it's not as if Mass General Hospital has uh, the total patient volume that changes uh, by 100% or 200% a day. I mean, it's not like a Poisson process. It's not crazy that way. So we know a certain number of people are going to fall sick, and we know a law of large 
large numbers who work. And so, you know, I don't want to invoke central limit theorem and all that here. But, but uh, generally speaking, the likelihood that a certain number of patients will come in during the day is more or less steady, and then there is some variation on the theme. So I think many, uh, uh, many uh, 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 service providers, uh, whether they are uh, Chipotle or anything else, uh, have uh, right, I've figured out uh, that you need to have some baseline, and then you have some surge capacity, and you go forward. And there's no reason why uh, hospitals need, you know, need need to do that. Uh, I think there are also innovations being put in place where uh, I think uh, you want to contract and say, look, I will buy X amount of dollars of pharmaceuticals from you. I just don't know which exact pharmaceuticals will I buy in what month. But what if I told you I'm going to do $1.1 billion of uh, uh, you know, work with you and give me like a 10 percent, uh, you know, plus or minus uh, uh, quantity flexibility on that. So this is a futures market. Why don't we have a futures market for healthcare? It's not even a futures market. It's just a. Uh, 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 so if, if you're a supplier of, uh, of pharmaceuticals and you're concerned about, hey, what is my quarterly numbers being met and so on and so forth, w what if somebody like, uh, you know, Highmark came out and said, look, I'm X billion dollar business, the likelihood that I will buy X over $8 billion of, uh, uh, you know, uh, stuff from you uh, uh, is, is, I mean, y I mean you can more or less guarantee a certain kind of uh, uh, yeah. you know, business, right? Ma yeah, so, so maybe oh, I can please. jump in. Um, so I think I'm going to pick up on the innovation question that, that you were sort of hinting at. And I think that um, um, in some ways, healthcare has tremendous innovation happening. Um, we see the application of advanced analytics and AI in ways that are uh, fantastic, just really, really insightful. And um, we're just now, I think, uh, learning to harness them. I think um, you're shaking your head, so we should talk about that, okay? <laughs> Um, I think uh, we see uh, medical technology innovation happening. Um, it's actually very hard on the ground, and I'll, I'll speak as an operator now, as a, you know, I, that runs, uh, you know, kind of a large set of operations. Uh, it's actually very hard as an operator to drive those innovations uh, through. And it, healthcare is a heavily regulated industry. Uh, heavily regulated through a very complex set of regulatory uh, bodies. Uh, you've got CMS regulations, you've got uh, state regulations, uh, Department of Health, PID. Um, and so if you are actually uh, trying to implement uh, new and innovative solutions, it, there's quite a challenge in terms of uh, adhering to a very, very complex and Byzantine set of uh, regulatory uh, rules to make some of those things happen. Now that said, um, I think the industry needs to embrace innovation and needs to sort of push forward. And so um, when I think about things like what Highmark Health is trying to do, like a lot of the capital investment that we have made in this market with Allegheny Health Network, where a large integrated delivery and financing system, is to build access points that are in the community, that are much, much uh, smaller footprint lower uh, fixed cost type of access points that are in the community. So we break the model of having to send everybody downtown and people can receive high quality care in the community. When you talk about sort of leveling demand, maybe we can't level demand, but we can certainly level, level uh, revenue, right? So payment models like global budget models um, that we have in place with a number of large health systems across uh, the, f the state, including with Allegheny Health Network, level the flow of revenue that a hospital has and allows for uh, more stable planning for that uh, system. And then there's kind of a true up process on the back end. Uh, and so that sort of moves the hospital uh, to risk, if you will, and they have to plan uh, their cost structure to the revenue per patient on a risk adjusted basis that they think is gonna come into the door. So there are ways to embrace, even within the complexity of our healthcare system, to push innovation forward. And that leads to the adoption of new models of care, which are uh, very compelling and very uh, powerful. So I think that there are ways to sort of move this forward, but uh, I'll tell you, uh, it, it, in healthcare it ain't easy. Thanks. Uh, Amelia, please, and then I'm going to use moderator's prerogative to jump in a little bit as well. Yep. Please do. And so I'll be a little bit extreme in, in my response, which is that it, there is an innovation because they don't have to, um, that we haven't pushed them. If those who are served the least by our healthcare system have very little power in our society. Those who don't have health insurance are very 
under, under, underserved. And even through the employer-sponsored market, the incentives are off, right? So the, it's the employer who's, who's buying the, the insurance, and, and employees are unhappy with it. It's unlikely that that's actually going to change very much. There aren't very many options. Um, there are some times, I think, you know, and I've, I touch in on these different um, healthcare and AI um, uh, efforts that are going on, and, and it seems remarkable at how, how hard it is to, 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 to move some of that in. There absolutely are things happening, absolutely, and I don't know nearly enough to understand how hard it is to move. Um, but there are lots of areas where they're much more flexible. And then every once in a while something happens, right? So like Medicare said, they're not going to pay for the care that you receive when you are readmitted to a hospital. And all of a sudden, hospitals got super serious about finding out what you were going home to and sending you somewhere different and buying you an air conditioner and paying the bill, right? So sometimes policy can really change something. Thanks. So I'm going to push back a little bit on a couple things. Um, first, uh, anything we can do, if it'll actually save money and not reduce value, I'll take it. I don't care if it's like one-eighth of one percent, I'll take it. Having said that, I think ops and supply chain management, that's not where the action is. Unpredictability of demand, that matters some. That's just not where the action is. Now, again, uh, folks like you can Fix those problems, fantastic, I'll take it. But I don't think that's where we need to be devoting the majority of efforts. That's not the problem. I think we got a whole bunch of problems. One of those, quite frankly, is uh, market power, uh, dominant provider systems, dominant health systems. And if they don't want to do something, they're not going to. Why? Because they don't have to. That includes accepting new forms of payment from private health insurers, work that I've done with my colleagues has shown that when there are hospital systems that face very little potential competition, guess what? They get paid on a fee-for-service basis because that's what they like. They're not bearing risk that way, and they refuse other forms of payment that get paid a lot more. They funnel everything in to the inpatient ship. The other thing about sort of AI, IT more generally is this. The one form of IT that got adopted very, very rapidly and is still very heavily used, most heavily used in the entire system, some of you probably know this, you may or may not know, has to do with using IT to maximize revenue, to generating the, the, uh, the code, the diagnosis of procedure code for a given uh, patient for a given treatment that will maximize revenue. That's what it's gotten used for. Everything else is really quite secondary. Now, again, it's not as if we haven't made progress. And to be fair, anytime we have innovation, there's a slow pace of fast change. So if you look at what happened in the US when we switched over from steam to electric power, it took manufacturing decades to figure that out. Why? Because there's a human element. And it's critical and it's hard. But I'm going to come back to my previous point. Guess what? If you don't have to, you're not going to, and if you're not pushed, you're not going yeah. to. So lack of competition, I think, is one of the most pervasive problems in the U.S. healthcare Marty, I system. Think, I think uh, right. Good. Uh, I, I, managed I, th to I thought maybe you were going to then uh, just encourage everyone in the room to use the Allegheny Health Network. <laughs> <laughs> so we're I Carnegie just, Mellon. We're Switzerland. Just, uh, we don't okay, take, right, we don't okay. take sides. Sorry. I was just checking. But I'll just the, check. I do want to. I do want to pick up... <laughs> I do want to pick up on one comment. <laughs> I do want to pick up on one comment around the analytics because I, I, maybe I have a different point of view. Sure. Um, you know, we have uh, a data science, uh, we have a, a group of data scientists that are uh, actively working on bringing together uh, claims data, clinical data, uh, you know, lab data, pharmacy data, social determinants data and using that to uh, predict the trajectory of uh, individuals' um, uh, care costs and disease progressions, and using that predictive modeling to then uh, intervene with the right clinical care models at the right point in time for those patients. And we see material improvements in uh, uh, kind of uh, outcomes. And by the way, healthcare is one of the only industries that I'm aware of where there's like a really strong inverse correlation between how much the care costs and uh, the quality of the care, right? So high quality care 
and uh, effective care tend to walk hand in hand in healthcare. Um, and, and it's because of the pricing power and the distortions in the market with regard to, uh, you know, kind of how, how care is delivered. But I would just push back and say there's, a, I believe, huge opportunity in the application of, you know, kind of uh, ad advanced uh, analytics, uh, machine learning to the problems of healthcare so that we are intervening in the rising risk portion of a individual's journey in healthcare as opposed to after a whole bunch of problems already present. Oh, sure. Look, I, I, don't get me wrong. I think we do have lots of opportunities. I also don't want to oversell some of this stuff. We have, you know, again, we, we tend to be in love with stuff that's brand new and shiny. Uh -huh. and, 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 you know, it's, it's worth it. But, uh, but my issue is not that the, that the opportunity is not there. It's not happening, and it's because we're not getting pushed to do it. Yep. So, Rumi so wanted to it, jump in. in this light, and with respect, Tom, I actually, you, you've said two things that I, I actually want to gently disagree with you on, right? <laughs> One, or I want to point out. <laughs> <laughs> One is it's, it's very common, and it happens, it happens in pharmaceutical companies where people who have not worked in other industries will say, oh, you know, pharma, you know, healthcare is very regulated, pharmaceuticals are very regulated. No, banking is regulated, okay? I used to work at Bloomberg. And I'm telling you, banking and finance is a hell of a lot more regulated than healthcare. So let's bear in mind that a simpler system, which also has this massive inverse correlation, that if you if you pay me a million dollars to invest your money, I will not do a good job. Okay? If you just buy the S&P 500 or something that tracks with it, you'll do pretty well, right? So you and this is a very serious problem. We only recently, in the last maybe 20 years, started to having better ideas for how currency ought to work, okay? So even with something as advanced as money, we're still in a very nascent position of understanding what does, how do you manage an economy, right? So healthcare has exactly, I think, the same sorts of things. So I'm, I'm very much with you, Marty. I, I you know, uh, we have lots of inefficiencies that are due to uh, competition, right? And how competition is being played out, whether it's done well or not. Um, an inappropriate understanding of how uh, regulation actually affects a policy, right? We, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's amazing because it's almost exactly analogous to just finance. And yet we think of healthcare as something different. And again, your behaviors that are not necessarily fiscal affect your fiscal behaviors, right? So the way you drive your car has an ultimate economic change but we don't calculate how did you drive your car. Now, insurance companies are starting to monitor this, yeah. and maybe this goes back to your claims and providers and so on. So anyways, Marty, that's, uh, yeah. Thanks. that's that. Thanks. So um, I, if uh, Sridhar or, or Amelia would like to jump in on this quickly, that's great, but I do want to move into the, to the bombshell topic. Amelia was fortunately raised earlier, and that's single payer, and we've certainly heard about that, the drum beats are, are happening along the Potomac. And I, I think it'd be worthwhile for us to spend a few minutes on that. So let me just ask, let me start with Sridhar, and let's just go quickly down the line. Thoughts about single payer, right? We, we, we spent nearly over an hour actually uh, cataloging how poorly healthcare works, right? It doesn't serve consumers, doctors are unhappy, right? The farm industry isn't functioning the right way, so on and so forth. Should we just throw the whole thing out and start over? Sridhar. So let me, uh, well, first, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, uh, but that hasn't stopped me in the past from, uh, <laughs> I mean, I've been teaching for 28 years. So, I mean, so the lack of knowledge has not stopped me from, you know, winning teaching awards, actually. But uh, uh, in fact, I've found uh, that my classes are received very well when they know very little. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Anyway, so uh, this might be received very well. So let's but have this be like sort of 30 second quick there you go. responses. I, I, I think government is not the uh, solution, government is the problem. Okay, so let me, invoking uh, Reagan on this matter, uh, I look at how the VA is uh, managed, and uh, I would hate uh, that uh, uh, the rest of us have to be managed and live that way. So I would be uh, very, very cautious against single payer government control systems. Tom. Yeah, I mean, 30 seconds. Yep, yeah, I'd say... Um, seconds to solve the whole problem. Yeah. I'd say the majority of Americans get their health care through private insurance, uh, you know, and 80% uh, of those through employer-sponsored insurance. And so uh, hard to imagine a system uh, kind of 
getting thrown out where um, you know two thirds of Americans are are accessing their health care in that way. Um, uh, so uh, and then I look at the conversation that we just had, which is where are the failures of the healthcare system in terms of uh, the unsustainability of the cost? Because that's really at the root of the problem, right? Is that the fact that the system is unsustainable in a way for households, for people, for, um, for uh, employers. And so, uh, you know, I think tackling that uh, is kind of at the heart of the issue. Thanks. Let me donate my time to Amelia, because I'm dying okay. to hear what you have to say. All right, you get 60 seconds. Of <laughs> oh, okay. So I think it's only part of the problem. I think part of it is, is I don't know why employers are involved in health insurance. I mean, there's a question of whether government should be. And the VA is a different system that is serving different needs. There are a bunch of things that they're doing really well, actually, um, in addition to some things that are moving poorly. A bunch of quality metrics. They're all in the same EHR. They do a bunch of uptake stuff because they control the whole system. Um, that's going pretty well. And Medicare, right? So on the Medicare side, one of the other things is about quality. What do we know about the quality that we're getting, right? And one of the things that government oversight does that we have not been able to do in this big employer-sponsored thing is learn about the quality of the care that we receive, right? So Medicare, they collect quality information. They post it publicly. They actually pay them differently based on that quality information. And we know none of that in our employer-sponsored insurance. Employers, even huge ones, have not pushed for that information, right? So CMS just says, you have to survey your, your, your participants. You've got to tell us whether everyone's got their clinical quality. And so then we know. And they actually can move towards shutting down ones that are the least probably. So where is the accountability in all of this is another problem. So where single payer, actually, there are some options. So th there you go. Thanks. Yeah, so I, I think actually, given everything we've heard and also all the things we're hearing out there in the public, I think we're looking at a larger government role regardless of exactly what form that may take. And it is, it is true that uh, most other countries have some kind of form of a very, very heavy government financing and sometimes provision of health care, but there are trade-offs. You could move to a UK National Health Service, and in many ways that actually performs well, but you'd probably be giving some things up. You could move to the provincial health insurance systems that Canada has. You could move to Australia, where there's a base public health insurance policy that people can add on top of that. I think it's something that we should be considering in the debate, but we also should be considering perhaps also more incremental approaches. But regardless, I think we're talking about government taking a larger role. We have these systems where the markets alone just can't do the job. At a bare minimum, they need a helping hand. So we've been talking for a long time, and of course we all love to hear ourselves talk, but we do want to allow some time for questions from the audience. Now, um, two rules about that. It has to be a question, not a statement. If you can't make it have a question mark at the end, then you have to go sit down. Um, the question can take no longer than 30 seconds to state. It's not a statement. You have something you want to ask, that's great. We'd like to, like to hear it. So, so please, with that, let's open up the floor to questions. So, um, Steve Krugrov, or Yaroslav, and uh, I'm working currently for UPMC, the health plan, so happy to see competition. As a, I am an economist, so I'm happy to see competition. I agree with your uh, observation that prices are uh, the most important driver of the increase in health costs. I've actually, I work with the data and I have seen this. So the question is why? So you brought up a lack of competition, obviously, but as a trained microeconomist, uh, I can also point out a couple other things uh, like uh, lack of transparency on pricing, uh, switching costs, uh, and the overall attitude that my health is the last thing where I'm going to save money, especially if it's not my health, but my family. So which of this, so how do you think these factors interact? Yeah, I mean, all, a, a good point, and thank you for making it a question at the end, Yaro. I greatly, I greatly appreciate it. All, all of those, all of those things, uh, things matter. There's no one thing, and that's one thing that makes it all hard, right? We only had an hour. We couldn't give over to you sort of all of the complexities in, in the system. Personally, if it were me and I could only choose one thing, 
I would choose more vigorous competition. Even if consumers aren't paying, there's competition to get contracts with health insurers, and that's currently right now, that's what, that's what drives, drives prices. But you're absolutely right, it's a multifaceted problem. Please, sir. Uh, yes, first I just wanna say uh, thank you. This has been a terrific panel, and, and a whole day of activity has been terrific. Um, my name is Bruce Rolman. I'm a primary care physician. I'm a professor of medicine and also a director of the um, uh, Technology Center at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, a couple of thoughts. Marty, I thought that you were going to mention something about Uwe Reinhardt when his famous story, uh, article about uh, it's the price is stupid and about, you know, why are we paying so much more in the United States than in other, than in other uh, Western countries when we saw the keynote this morning, our prices are way out of line compared in our outcomes aren't as good. Um, to Tom, I wanted to ask too, you'd mentioned some of the uh, things with policy, um, and you know, some of the things are very hard, like people changing their behavior for food and, and so on, but we've seen changes like when trans fats were legislated out of the food supply, heart attack rates went down, or other things, higher tobacco taxes led to decreases in smoking and related heart disease and lung cancer and so on. So I'm just wondering also about other ideas where health insurers or other people might get in, involved with legislation uh, to maybe it's gun gun uh, safety advocacy or, or, or other things that might make might re seriously reduce beyond just the what can hospitals do. And finally, to Amelia, uh, if you can comment, you were starting to touch about this and, and there's a thought about that you you get what you, the outcomes that you pay for. So one thought, and maybe you're touching on this too, about with quality metrics, um, is about potentially even moving hospitals to be caring just for the patients inside the walls, but for a hospital to be responsible and perhaps paid by the health of the community in which it serves. So it might be moving away, you know, as places rural hospitals are under strain. Thank, I, I'm just thanks, would uh, like love those, to hear your those ideas. Those are all great questions. I'm, yeah. I'm going to actually perhaps restrict to the last question to Amelia, which is about population health. Does it make sense at all that healthcare providers should be responsible for population health, particularly when there's so many drivers of that that are completely outside their control? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. It's, um, I think that the, I think, I really think that the, the quality transparency is important and, and what we measure and who it matters to also matters. Um, and so measuring readmissions really change things. Um, you know, the policies around taxes on sodas, right? And, tax, you know, so it's not just people have behaviors in a void. People yeah. have behaviors that are exactly. strongly influenced by um, what's by the policies that are happening and, you know, all these diseases of despair, right? They're f despairing for a reason, right? Okay, so hospitals. Rural hospitals is a challenge right now, and I think that they're, that, that aligning payment with, with other outcomes is, is a very interesting thing to think about because they have a lot of real estate. They don't have as many people who need that version of care. Telemedicine has some real possibilities in terms of being able to still house ICUs, for instance, in that location that are in some ways main, you know, managed by experts elsewhere through a video and they can still get all the data. But what else those um, hospitals can be used for, I think is an interesting, uh, there are some interesting options. Great, thank you. Uh, next person, please. And again, please keep it a question and keep it brief, thank you. Okay. Thank you. And my name is Ivan Pistsov. I'm a Tepper alum, and I'm also founder of CareDirect. Uh, our goal was to help individuals save on healthcare by eliminating the excessive complexity of decision making in uh, purchasing, in selecting the health plan. While working on this on this project, I've discovered that there is a new field, uh, new for me, field uh, of uh, healthcare, which is cash-based medicine. In cash-based medicine, doctors and patients deal without any middleman, without insurance company. Okay, could you please state what the question is? Yeah, so the point is, um, in cash-based medicine, uh, cash, uh, the price for procedure can be anywhere from five, six, seven, up to 10 times cheaper than the cash-based price in a regular hospital. To me, that shows that there is a great amount of slack in what, what is the question, please? Is, is, do you have a question? Uh, yes. Okay, please you know, state the question. Thank you. Okay, so 
do you see the, uh, the opportunity for innovation in care delivery system, in particular use of technology to reduce the chain of uh, cost to make healthcare more affordable? Okay, anybody want to respond to, to that? Tom, please. I'll, I'll, I'll try. Um, I think for most uh, hospitals, the price per service and the variation of price per service are not well aligned to the cost per service. So the economic cross-subsidization that happens in the healthcare system is, is, is very profound. So, um, you know, what uh, uh, Medicare is paying versus what a commercial insurer is paying versus what Medicaid is paying versus what you're paying out of pocket if you were just going and paying straight for the service are all, all over the place. And, um, you know, there's reasons for that because hospitals have to, in aggregate, get to a sustainable position for their, for their system. So there absolutely is room for care innovation. There absolutely are proven ways to reduce the cost of care. Uh, using uh, different kind of uh, care delivery models. Uh, there are absolutely ways to uh, define best path, best practice care pathways that result in better outcomes. Um, uh, and uh, that absolutely has to be part of the solution to uh, sort of addressing this wild disparity in cost depending on what insurance card you're carrying or what uh, sort of the, your payer is, whether it's employer or government. Yeah, I'll just say, the problem is that we don't know how to do things. We don't know how to do everything. But actually, there are a lot of things that we know that could make things better and cheaper. That's not the problem. The problem is incentives. That's the problem. Th thank you. Could we have the next question, please? Incentives and lifestyle. Well, right? Because you're yeah. buying a lifestyle. Well, and, and lifestyle, I'd say, is not so much an incentive problem. It's got to do with how we're wired. And that's really, really hard not to crack. Yeah, you can start taxing soda pop more, and that might be a good idea. It might not. But I think, that, uh, I think that's actually the hardest nut of all to crack. No, I, I get it, just, but just for one second, if I may, like the trans fats, okay? So that was just a lifestyle choice, right? It was very quick to convince people that trans fats equals bad because we were selling people a lifestyle along with the french fries. Right, the lifestyle is you can have your French fries, but it's just not with trans fats, right? So some things can happen very quickly. You're, yeah, I agree with you in totality, Marty. But I, some things can happen very quickly if you oh, and, and look, sell the Red Bull gives you wings idea. Yeah, look, yeah. we—it's not like we shouldn't try. We should, and there are successes, right? Look at cigarette smoking and tobacco. Absolutely. Far lower than it took a long time. It's not that we shouldn't try, but I think it's a tough nut to crack. And we also shouldn't necessarily do something like say, well, we should get hospitals to oh, do sure, that. Sure. Sure. Anyway, we were talking among ourselves, which Sorry. is unfair to you, so please. I'll take my 30 seconds. My name is Catherine Gohatsu, and I'm a two-time graduate from computer engineering and the Tepper School. Um, I currently work for a healthcare payer, so my question is, um, I would, I'd like your thoughts on the administration's um, proposals on pricing transparency. When I think about innovation, I think about um, uh, LASIK, I think about Invisalign, elective procedures that have really brought the price down and is seen to really innovate, and I don't see that um, on, in pricing in hospitals, in competition. And the second thing is, though, if in fact that happens, not just the price listed but the price paid, does that actually change the choices made if the beneficiary or the person doesn't bear the full cost? So, so um yeah, which cost is, is made available to people matters a lot, right? And almost all the legislation about it has been this list price, which nobody pays, right? So, um, and that the price, for depending on which insurance card you have, is wildly different, right, across different people. So all that's a problem. Um, the other thing is that when those tools are made available by an insurer for the beneficiaries of those plans, most people don't use them. Right? They don't use the cost plans. They still are going almost entirely by word of mouth. And it's, it's rare that they change which person they go to based on, on that price. There is still a perception that they will get better quality for a higher price, even though there is at least on, uh, you know, on a large scale, there's at least a slight negative. I won't say it's that strongly negative, but it is not positive, that correlation. So getting people to choose, if for, you know, LASIK, they think they're going to get the same thing, right? But if, and so maybe they'll, they'll do it on price. 
But I think there's real problems. Who are you making the prices transparent to? The patient, or are you making the prices transparent to the doctor? They're very interesting things when you make the prices transparent to the doctor. Yeah. So, so I, I think that I think there's some potential there, but I think we have to be careful. So, most of the healthcare spending is on things that are really expensive, that are relatively rare and are very serious. Anybody who has any kind of a reasonable health insurance policy, and they should will be beyond, be beyond the cost-sharing portion of their policy, and they'll have no reason to pay attention to relative prices. And that's good, because they should be insured. But that means that's off the table, as far as transparency. That's still money left on the table, and if we can save money, I'll take it. Diagnostic imaging services, things like that. But what Amelia said is correct. I was on a Pennsylvania State work group on shoppable care, and we had every health insurer in the state pretty much come in and demo things, and most of those tools were honestly terrible. And we, they also all told us things like nobody uses them. So I think there are things we can do, but I think we have to be realistic about what we can accomplish. And, uh, and, and we have to think, think carefully about that. So I'll take it if we can do better, but is that going to transform the entire healthcare system? Marty, I'd, I'd no. like to see more quality transparency. A hundred percent. That's part of what makes it useful. If you get this long list you have to scroll through and it just shows a whole bunch of things and you don't have anything about quality, people aren't going to find... It has to be in a way people can use. And we haven't quite figured that out yet. And we're still working on even how to measure quality. Amelia's research is at some of the forefront on that. So great question. I think there is potential, but we're certainly not there. We have time for one last Can question. Can I add a, just one piece that uh, I think should be mentioned since we are talking about measurement and quality and, and the advantage of, uh, let's say, CMS uh, forcing quality measurement. Uh, I'm going to give you the uh, transplant example. Uh, CMS measures uh, one and three year uh, post transplant success, and if you drop below that, uh, you know you get some chance to uh, get better uh, or you know uh, get off uh, the payment. It sounds good, right? So what's going on? MGH, UCSF have stopped doing risky transplants because nobody is penalized if somebody dies. So this is the problem I have when you think theoretically and nicely about, hey, wouldn't it be nice if uh, we measured uh, the outcomes, and, but since we cannot measure all outcomes and all things are not controllable, uh, it lands up having some uh, perverse uh, issues. And right now, the, so many people are dying that don't have to die uh, because the transplant surgeons and the transplant centers just don't want to do these transplants. So I just want to pr provide another view that uh, providing quality metrics on subset of things, uh, while good, have actually uh, potentially very perverse incentives. That's Indeed, it. and it's, it's a known problem, and we haven't yet figured out how to deal with it. Now, uh, we have time for one last question, please. Hello, uh, intro, Alexandra Allen, current Hein student of these two lovely people. Background, I was a health insurance navigator for basically undocumented and low-income families in the Pacific Northwest. Question. In response to social determinants of health driving chronic illnesses that comprise roughly 85 to 95 percent of national health expenditures, how does the health industry respond by continuing to direct resources toward treatment and preventative care that is still confined within the scope of those social determinants of health that patients cannot change, or does the industry do something different? Thanks very much. So anybody want to want to respond, Rumi? So just, just one quick thing. It was mentioned earlier today that one of the amazing things that we found in machine learning, so I'm going to switch now from being a, a that kind of scientist to the, you know, the other kind of scientist, right, is that um, by extracting a great deal of very high order correlative data and distilling that into some condensed representation that seems to be predictive of other things, which I think is, I'm echoing what Ronnie said earlier, um, we've gotten a great deal of predictive power in a lot of settings. You just made, and by the way, congratulations for asking a very terse question. I'm very pleased. Thank <laughs> so you. So you just asked a question that, that also exhibits a bit of a bias in it, okay? Yes. So there is, 
there's sampling bias, there's survivor bias in what data I think is antecedent to your question. We don't have good representations for what healthy people who are disadvantaged go through. We have a rough idea in some cases of what healthy white male Americans are like, okay? So survivor bias precludes our ability to go beyond, to, the, in machine learning terms you call this generalization, to generalize our models to what is the, the health status of the people who managed to survive to be healthy in these environments that you're talking about. So, so it's the way we're going to have to overcome this is just by sampling healthy people, not just people who are sick, for us to understand how to address and redress the problems that perhaps are borne by the social circumstance. Okay, so it's a math problem, it's Bayes' rule. We simply have to sample the missing set. Yeah? Yeah, Ruma, I'd also say it's a human problem, yeah. right? So, um, you know, I think, you know, we sometimes lose sight of the actual lived experience that people go through and the challenges that folks who, uh, you know, don't necessarily come from a lot of means have in terms of uh, dealing with the complexities and um, stress and risks associated with uh, the healthcare system. So, uh, you know, as a, as a, you know, part of the healthcare industry, I think this is a really profound question that you're asking. And I, I don't think that the industry has a good answer. Uh, you know, what we try to do is, you know, we're investing in capabilities to try to expand the scope of things that we're worried about, but they still largely are, as you point out, kind of within scope. And um, you know, I don't, I don't know what the answer is to your question, but it's a, it's a really, really important question. That's a good systems level response for both. All right. Well, well, I, uh, that's that's wonderful, and sort of uh, thank you very much, uh, Alexander, for a very important, in a sense, kind of overarching question about health and healthcare in the United States. And again, it is a very challenging issue and a challenging question. I want to ask you to join me in thanking our wonderful panelists. I think we had a, a great discussion and wonderful questions from, from the audience. And, uh, and so thanks very much. And now we're going to move on to the next segment of the program. We're fortunate enough to, uh, to have our uh, provost here, uh, James Garrett, who, uh, who will take us to uh, the conference closing remarks. And, uh, and Jim is a, a longtime member of the Carnegie Mellon faculty. He's been here at the Carnegie Institute of Technology since, since 1990 and uh, was a faculty member for a long time, became dean. And then to our good fortune, uh, really very recently, just January of this year, he became provost of the university. So please join me in welcoming Provost Jim Garrett. Thank you, Marty, for your kind words. Uh, good afternoon to you all. First, I'd like to thank all of the panelists and all the participants in this year's Intersect at CMU Conference for joining us at Carnegie Mellon for this important forum about healthcare. Let's give everybody another round of applause. I'd also like to thank uh, Steve Downs, the Chief Technology and Strategy Officer for Wa Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for his keynote remarks. Daryl Britt, the President and Founder of Aprio Incorporated and Aprio Health, for his outstanding support of our conference as a presenting sponsor, as well as for sharing his perspectives. And our gold sponsors, Optum and UPMC Enterprises, and to our silver sponsor, Liftoff Pittsburgh and the Jewish Healthcare Foundation. Let's give all of our sponsors, and especially Daryl, a great round of applause. And finally, much appreciation goes to Alan Scheller, Alan Scheller Wolf and Shavin Yeltekin from the Tepper School of Business, as well as all members of the conference's planning and operations committee for coordinating this special opportunity for conversations. As I mentioned last night at the welcome dinner, here at Carnegie Mellon, it's part of our mission to do work that changes the world. Our university's research and education are aimed at real world outcomes and benefit all members of society. 
Finding ways to improve health care through in innovation certainly exemplifies this effort. This pioneering work and research that we do at Carnegie Mellon requires wide-reaching participation and broad collaboration across many disciplines. This year's Intersect at CMU conference certainly represented our approach as students, scholars, and alumni from our business, engineering, entrepreneurship, life sciences, design, public policy, and computer science disciplines came together and shared their expertise and knowledge with all of you. Yet, this focus on collaboration inside our campus is just one part of what is necessary to help the healthcare industry evolve and prosper for the benefit of all. To make real monumental impact, we'll need collaboration from many groups beyond Carnegie Mellon researchers and, and students from other universities, scientists, medical practitioners, entrepreneurs, policy experts, and leaders at innovative healthcare companies and in government. It's important that we continually engage conversations, idea sharing, and most of all, support each other in all that we endeavor. Understanding and exploring the current state of healthcare and how we can inf help influence its future impact through innovation, technology, and business are by no means simple tasks. Together, I believe we're ready to achieve remarkable success in transforming and improving this field. And I hope that you found this year's Intersect at CMU as just the start of ongoing dialogues and partnerships and have been inspired by the opportunities that lie ahead. Again, Thanks for attending this year's conference, and I hope that you've enjoyed your time here at Carnegie Mellon. I'd like to now welcome and thank again Shaveen Yeltekin, Tepper School Associate Dean of Education, and Alan scheller Wolf, Tepper's Associate Dean of Research, to share some closing remarks. Let's give them a big round of applause as they come to the stage. Thank you, Provost Garrett, for your remarks. And um, we're going to be brief. I know it's been a long day. We started quite early. Um, we are at the end of our program. I hope that we hope that you enjoyed the discussion. We certainly did. Um, and I hope that this is this intersection and this discussion doesn't end here. That we look forward to further discussion, both outside uh, for the reception, but also as we go forward, try to solve a lot of the problems and crack a lot of the nuts that uh, that were told. And as uh, Barbara Shin Cunningham said in the earlier panel, I hope. The fact that there are big problems out there doesn't, or, or that lack of information out there doesn't discourage us, but actually encourage us, uh, encourages us to do more research, more collaboration, and more discussion. And that's a shout out to all of the students who are in here as well, no matter what your path forward is. So thank you for attending and participating. We'd also like to once again take a moment to, take, to uh, thank the two organizing committees. The program committee who set the program for the speakers and the operations committee who made it all happen. The operations committee was chaired by John Sangenberger. Thank you, John. And Kate Walters, the person who's been making everything run like clockwork. Thank you, Kate. There's also a closing reception right outside the auditorium for everyone. We hope you'll continue to your discussion there. And I guess the last thing I want to say is I don't know exactly when Intersect 2020 will be. We haven't yet decided what the topic will be, but it will be outstanding. And I hope to see you here next year. Thank you. Please join us outside.